but in our mini series of people whose lives have been changed by Jesus, our attention this morning is on two sisters, Mary and Martha. They have a brother, Nazareth, who was raised from the dead by Jesus. Now, in a few verses, Luke has given us a very brief account of an incident that took place in their home around the kitchen and dining area. What took place there may appear very ordinary, mundane, and that could happen in many of our homes in similar circumstances. However, I believe what Jesus has said to them, except uh, and, uh, to Martha, is exactly what we need to hear for our busy living in the 21st century. Yes, in our modern day lives, we are often overworked and chased by deadlines after deadlines. And we seem to be running from one appointment to another with very little time in between, even for a proper lunch break. Well, let us hear what Jesus advised to Martha over this critical issue. What is necessary? So we are going to firstly look at the question, what is necessary in our lives? What is necessary for you now? And then next, we are going to give some consideration on two seemingly contrast lifestyle. One is a life of active service, and the other is a completely different living in quietness and a quiet life of retreat. So are there any area in between? And we are going to look at this. And then thirdly, and how did Jesus manage to live between these both tensions? One is living a very busy life and yet finding time to retreat and be alone with God the Father. How did he do it? And then fourthly, and uh, we're looking at some practical suggestions, which I find it helpful. So I hope you will find it helpful too. Well, firstly, what is necessary? Now, Luke has only given us five verses in this brief account. Chapter 12, uh, 10 of verse 38. Jesus and his disciples were on their way, perhaps to Jerusalem, but on their way they stopped at a village. Now, Mark, uh, Luke did not give us the name, but we know from John Gospel, Mary and Martha live in Bethany. And uh, Martha has opened her home and invited Jesus and the disciples to come in. Now on this occasion, the focus is very much on the two sisters, since Nazareth wasn't mentioned. Now, what do you think of Martha? Well, firstly, by inviting Jesus to her home, clearly it means she enjoys Jesus' company. Perhaps you would like to spend more time with Jesus to find out more from Jesus what he has to say about the kingdom of God. Maybe, you know, she likes to throw a meal, cook something special for him and his disciples. How often you have guests like Jesus coming home for dinner. Now, if so, what would you prepare for him if he were to come to your place today? So you could imagine Martha's excitement and her eagerness to make sure the place is clean. I remember before the guests come, we run round to make sure the toilet is clean, the bins are empty, so that the guests can sit comfortably. So I'm sure Martha is no different. She was busy getting the place ready. And also, she has to cook 
and prepare a meal. In this case, not only for the family, uh, we have no idea what other family members has she got. Just simply, perhaps, just Martha and Mary and the brother Nazareth. So cooking a dinner for three or four people is different to cooking for, you know, 15, if you count Jesus and the 12 disciples. Well, I'm sure she could do with some additional help. But when she saw the sister, Mary, was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching, and she was a bit, perhaps, disturbed or distracted. Now, Luke used the word distracted to describe her state of mind. Perhaps she's unable to concentrate because of all the things she has to do. I've got a picture here. I don't know whether they are typical vegetables in, the, uh, in, in uh, Israel. But anyway, you could imagine she has to cut, wash, cook them. She has to find out, well, have I got enough herbs for this particular dish? And then there is bread to be kneaded and uh, you have to wait for the bread to rise before you roast it. And in the meantime, you have to make sure the soup is stirred and it's not burned. Now, the word distracted is, uh, uh, in the original, gives the meaning of she has been pulled in different directions. So you could see that, you know, look, I know that many people can be multitasked. Right? But surely, she said to herself, I could do with some help. And then she went over to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all these by myself? Now, what do you think of her reaction? Surely we can understand that situation. And she would be a bit stressed, naturally, without help. And perhaps you would be a bit resentful when you seem to be the only one working behind the, uh, the, behind the table while the others are sitting down and just enjoying their company with Jesus. Now, do you sense that slight resentment when Martha asked Jesus, tell Mary to help me? Now, what do you think of Jesus' answer? verse 41 oh. in verse 41 Jesus just called her name twice Martha Martha can you detect the tenderly tone she's calling Martha just to calm down I think it seems to say look I know your situation I'm fully aware of your frustration he went on to say, look, I know you're upset and worried about many things, right? Yes, it's right to be worried because you are wondering whether you can make it and you can cook all this in time. Yes, I know that you are a bit, you know, flustered. Up to that point, I think Martha was expecting Jesus and said, okay, you're right, you're on your own, and asked Mary to help in the kitchen. But then when Jesus went on and said, yes, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. What is that thing? Need help her? What is that thing? Now, in the NIV, it's translated, only one thing is needed. <clears throat> in the English Standard Version, it's translated as, one thing is necessary. What is that thing which is necessary? And then went on to say, well, Mary has 
chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Now, what does Jesus mean by what is necessary? Surely he is not saying, look, you need more hands in the kitchen, although, it, which is right. Surely Jesus understands the simple logic that many hands make the light work. People can do things quickly and easily when they work together in a big job. Now, and Jesus understands Martha's need in the kitchen. However, she said, there's one thing which is necessary. What is that? Now, I think sometimes it happens to us, isn't it? We're so preoccupied with the urgent deadlines and in situations like this, there's, more, there's nothing more than meeting the deadline. When you are being pulled in all directions, and everyone asks for your attention, the only solution that you think will be help, more resources. And if I'm on my own, I need to work over time, right? But in Martha's case, Jesus said, look, yes, from a cooking point of view, yes, you need help. But in a spiritual sense, there is something which you need to watch out, which is necessary for you. Sit down and listen, like the way Martha, uh, Mary is doing. Now, this does not say that it's not, it's not necessary for her to serve or to cook. But Jesus said, look, in your preoccupation with all the preparation, in your running around, in the midst of your busyness, you are losing something most essential. That is a sense of perspective. The pers that is the very reason for inviting Jesus. Now surely she wants to express her love to Jesus by showing hospitality and cooking them a meal. But surely the food is not the end itself, is it? It's only the means to spend more time with Jesus. So Jesus is pointing out to Mary, look, you are missing the very purpose of your invitation. You are missing the very thing that I can offer you. Right? <clears throat> Sometimes it's very often comes to our mind that it's not what we give to God that matters. Yes, our giving is, is an expression of our devotion to God, and God is pleased to accept it. But however, sometimes I think God doesn't need really my money. Does he? He's not that poor, is he? Instead, we need to think, sometimes our wonderful, rich Heavenly Father wants to impart something precious to us, but yet we have no time for Him. Now this is exactly the case here. Jesus is saying to, 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 to Martha, Martha, you need to sit down. You need to soak in all the things I have to say, like Mary. And this is the better one. This is a good portion, better than what you can offer me. You need to enjoy my presence. Not, that, not as a gift, but my being with you while he's there. Now, I think we make many mistakes and I make mistakes along the same line, especially in my earlier days um, in, my, in, in, in the ministry. <clears throat> we like to invite people home so that we can have more fellowship time, especially there are times when you can share in a private, in a comfortable environment where there is less distractions. And uh, you can open up and you can listen and find out you know, more about the other person 
know the concern, so that we can serve and pray for one another more intelligently. However, we're so preoccupied with the cleaning before they arrive, what to cook, and then work behind the stove and make our signature dish or something which our guests will like, which is good, which is great, which is essential. However, in our business, sometimes we find ourselves in reflection. The time that we spend with our guests is not as much as we like to. Sometimes, you know, in a conversation, people need time to warm up. They don't just come, sit down and come up with all their concerns, right? Sometimes you need to find out if the person really can connect with me, right? We do that, don't we? You want to see if the person actually understands your situation, and by hearing him or her, then you will decide, well, yes, I think I can trust this person with more. Then you begin to say a bit more. Now, I find that you know, this quality time is essential to build a trust, to nurture fellowship. Now, however, but when we are so preoccupied, with all these things, then we find that even sitting before them, our mind is distracted and we are not giving them the full attention, which defeats the whole purpose of inviting them home for fellowship. So it is not just the eating, it's a fellowship, it's a time to be with the person together. Now, so this is exactly the case in Martha, and we, are re- we need to be reminded by what Jesus says to Martha. There's one thing which is essential, one thing that is necessary, one thing that Martha has forgotten in the business of her activities. Now, <clears throat> so let's move on. It's a simple story, right? It's a simple event of a daily event. Now, I like to use this opportunity to to uh, consider some of the misconceptions among Christians on the matter of service, uh, especially sometimes um, a super superficial reading of this chapter may bring uh, some wrong interpretation to our understanding of Christian ministry. Now the first one is what I call it as active service against contempt- contemplative life. By that I mean in the person of Martha, it seems to symbolize there's a person here who is active, who is willing and she is giving her very best to prepare and to do all the practical things to entertain Jesus and his company, which is great. But on the other hand, in the person of Martha, she seems to symbolize a person who just spent time with God quietly, without disturbance. She can just focus on God. Now, is this incident is something to tell us these are the two choices. Is Jesus saying, look, Mary has taken the better choice. So the content, contemplative life is a better form of a lifestyle? Is it a better form of Christian service? What do you think? Well, let's look at it. Firstly, on the matter of Christian service. Now, what Martha does is practical things, which is essential, which is good. And uh, what Mary does, sitting with Jesus and listening to God's word, is also good. Now, 
is one better than the other? Before I answer this, sometimes I hear Christians say, well, I'm only good at, at practical things. I am able to clean the table, even clean the toilet, and I can be a steward. I will make myself available if I'm called upon, which is good. And God, I'm sure, is delighted with your service. But I'm not as good as the others who are better. They are better in God's word. They are involved in the ministry of God's holy word because they have time to spend before God in their Bible reading, in prayer, and they seem to have a better understanding of God's word. So I'm happy to do what I'm doing, the practical thing, to support what they are doing in the better things. Heard people said, Pastor, I have to work in the secular world. Unlike you, you are very fortunate. You can have time to spend with God, to read his word, to pray. And can you see the difference? What is secular? What is practical against what is sacred, holy? Now, they're both the same. We're just having a different role. As important as Martha, she's doing a essential job. If she doesn't do the cooking, there won't be any food for Jesus and the disciples and the whole party. And Jesus is, is, is not saying, look, Martha, you better stop. No need to cook. He acknowledged that. Yes, you're worried. Yes, you're concerned. You're distracted by all these good things. In Christian service, I would say, look, we are called to different role and to do different things. We just have different responsibility. And God asks, God asks us to be faithful in the discharge of our duties to use our potentials, to use our gifts faithfully. Remember the parable of the talents? For those who are in, entrusted with a thousand, a thousand is expected of them. To those who are entrusted with five thousand, five thousand is expected in the return of their efforts. Are we using them in proportion to our faith and what, what God has given us? So we might have different services, different roles, but we are required to be faithful in the use of them. Now secondly, it's about lifestyle now. Now again in the, in the person of Martha, it symbolises a kind of life of active service. And uh, yeah, you're doing many things for good for God. Is it good? Or the other one, symbolized by Mary, you just do one thing at a time. Just sit down. Find some moment where you can withdraw from the world so that you can spend time with Jesus alone without distractions. If you're married, if you have a full-time job, you got distractions. You have concerns. Rightly so. Provide for them. For those who are single, they think, oh, well, I'm more fortunate since I have less concerns. And others might think, well, no, better still, if I would be single and live in a secluded retreat, that would be good. I will be spiritual and God will be pleased. Is that so? But what did Jesus say to, his, to the disciples? You are the salt of the earth. Now, salt is only useful when it is spread out and used on either food or in preservations. 
salt is not good if it is just kept in a bottle. So in many ways, Christians are not to be hidden and kept away, just to enjoy our personal relationship with God without any care of the world, without any distractions from the mundane affair. No. What about the other incident? When Jesus took the disciples up to the hill and in front of them, they saw Jesus in his glory. And uh, it was so taken with all the wonder. And Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. What a wonderful time of spiritual retreat. Let us enjoy this. Let us be a shelter for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Let us stay here. What happened next? God, Jesus did not keep them there. Yes, they had a wonderful experience when they heard a voice from heaven. God the Father said, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And then, what next? They came down the mountain. And then, in the following chapter, in, Jesus sent them out two by two to every town and place where Jesus was about to go. You see, so in terms of lifestyle, they are not mutually exclusive. We are not told, well, there are some who are just busy in God's work and there are some who are just purely to make time for God and spend in the ivory tower. A Christian who lives a busy ministry needs to find time of retreat, find time to spend alone with God. And that's why Jesus said to Martha, yes, you are doing many necessary things, which is good, but one thing which is necessary for you right now is to spend time with me. And for those who spend a great deal of time just in prayer, in God's word alone, God said, look, don't, don't stay in the ivory tower. You need to go down to the world as God's witness, as salt, as light. Light is no use to be kept in a cave, under the table. No, Jesus said the light is to be put on the table, put on the, on the hill where people can see the light. See, so the Bible makes it very clear. It's not a either one or the other. Both are valid. Both are good. Both are required and necessary for a Christian to live an effective Christian life. And thirdly, we have come to a matter of duty and devotion. I think sometimes there is a danger to equate busyness, activities, and duties with devotions. What do I mean? Sometimes we have a notion, a wrong notion of, I'm so busy with Christian activities, I must be okay. Of course, I have the spiritual appetite or else I would not be here. I love God or else I would not be doing this. Really? And sometimes I think we get into the danger of Martha. She loves the Lord and that's why she wants to do the best for the Lord. She wants to do a lovely meal. Nothing wrong with it. However, sometimes in our preoccupation with our activities, we neglected our devotions. I think this is a warning for all those who are active, for those who are serving the Lord, either in small group as a leader or in a bigger uh, platform like on the pulpit like myself when i read the bible it's so easy to get into the danger of let me do the research let me just do all the exegesis, uh, exegesis 
and then find out what is the illustration and what application for the congregation. That's ministry focus. I fear that sometimes God is saying, look, I'm saying that to you. I need to ask God, what are you saying through your word to me? My job, yes, as a pastor, as a teacher, is to guide and to nurture people with God's word. But first and foremost, what are you saying to me through this? So we need to apply God's word in a devotional way, or else we will get burned out. And uh, I remember at the Bible College, our lecturer warned us, he said, look, when you are writing an essay, you are not just writing a paper. Yes, the academic knowledge is not useful unless you apply to that in a personal way. In other words, are you convicted by what you are reading? Is your life being changed as a result of what you are reading? Is God saying to, to you through this? So, a person who is very, very busy with God can run into the danger of replacing busy activities, duty, with devotion. So, Quickly, so how did Jesus cope with living a busy life and yet to find time for himself with the Father? Now, Mark has given us a very good incident. In Mark chapter 1, we read, oh, a day of busy activities. Jesus was busy from day to the evening. People brought the sick and the demon possessed to him. In verse 33, the whole town gathered at the door. So you could see that, you know, he hasn't got time even for himself because there are people outside. And uh, but he healed them and, um, and then now, you would have thought, after such a busy day of activities, a lie-in would be quite justified. But no, verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up. No, he wasn't going to heal any people. He wasn't going to give any lectures or any teaching on the kingdom of God. He went alone, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Is it in his public ministry when he was demanded by all these people? And you can't imagine a person busier than Jesus when he was on earth. And yet his guard, he guarded his personal devotional time with the Father and did so in private. Even get up early so that he would not be distracted, so that he can have that appointment time. I think that is a very, very good model for us, isn't it? Are you busy? Yes, we live a very busy life in the 21st century. But do we have time for God? Do we have any suggestions to help us? I find these suggestions helpful. So let me just quickly run through them. Firstly, we need to book an appointment. We do so when we see a doctor, when we see a specialist. So what's wrong to book an appointment with God? Now, there are people who said, well, I have, I have my devotional time in between this and in between that. I find it great. Now, devotional time is good when we read the Bible and pray. But sometimes I fear our devotional time is only a fleeting moment of just reading a few verses from the daily bread, say a quick prayer.
prayer and then rush off to the next thing on our agenda. Can we expect God to say anything to us if we don't sit still and give him the full attention like Mary does? Perhaps, you know, we're a bit like Martha. We're trying to do too many things at the same time. Do we have 30 minutes for God? Now, 30 minutes is not a lot. How long do you take for your lunch break? 30 minutes is only 2% of your life. If you spend 30 minutes with God every day, you're only using 2% of your life. Is that too much to give to God? Now, secondly, it's the quality of our prayer. Yes, yeah, spending time with God needs to have a time where you know that you will not be disturbed. Put away the phone. Right? If you have a room to yourself, go in, lock it, and put a sign, don't disturb. Away for 30 minutes. Give that minutes to God. And then spend in prayer. Now, I think sometimes in our prayer, we do all the ask, we do all the saying, don't we? Do we need 30 minutes in prayer? Well, we, don't, we, don't we run out of words in praise? Yes, we have a formula of praise, thanksgiving, applications and supplication. But we seem to just rush off to the next event, next item. Now, I wonder, sometimes we may need to just stop saying things. Just listen. In our prayer, instead of talking and telling God, God, don't you care? Like Martha, I'm so busy. I've got this. I've got that problem. I've got this issue. Don't you care? Can you get some help? Can you get Mary to help me? Ask him. Telling God what to do. The best is get someone now. Now, Jesus may be saying to us, look, instead of telling him what we want him to do for us, maybe we need to we need to just listen and close our mouths and hear what he has to say to us. The psalmist said, Be still and know that I am God. Now, be still not only refers to our physical stillness. When we come before God, ask God to still our spirit. To still not to say anything, just to ask him to say things that matters to us, say what is essential for us, see, tell us what we need to hear personally. Would you do that? Sometimes I think we are too preoccupied with the many things, the good things that we have to do for God and for the family and for, for whatever reasons. And sometimes we are so scared of being in silence. Next time when you pray, try this. Don't say anything. Just in silence. And ask God to show you what he wants you to know. Maybe when you do so, some Bible verses come to your mind. And maybe sometimes you may need to open up the Bible and read it. Now when you do so, I suggest to read the Bible slowly. Don't just read and, uh, oh, finished. <clears throat> Try to read it in a meditatively. What do I mean? Soak in every word. Maybe you like to pause and say, well, why? 
this word being used? Why not the other word? When Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better. So what is that better? What is that better that I have missed out? So when you do it, and consciously asking God to show you what he means, the, the psalmist said, meditate on God's word, day and night. Blessed is the person who does that. So, so in your 30 minutes of your devotional with God, you might find that God has put a verse in your mind or, or in your reading, you may find that, hang on, this seems to mean something to me today, but I haven't worked it out yet. But I've only got 30 minutes, so what do I do? Don't worry. You get up and do your work, but on every spare moment, ask God, what do you mean by that? Meditate on it. Think through it throughout the whole day. This is what learning to live in the presence of God. When you work, when you go about your daily lives, invite Jesus to be, work, to be walking with you. There was a, 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 a priest, Brother Lawrence, and he does washing and cleaning all day in a monastery. But yet he finds God's presence when he's washing dishes. That, to him, that was a precious moment when he was on his own with God and he was washing dishes, but he was fully aware of God's presence with him. Sweet moment of communion. And then, <clears throat> finally, there are two books other than the Bible which you need to bring with you in your devotion. One is a journal. It's a book to write down your devotional thoughts, to record some precious messages that you have received from God. When God seemed to have said something to you in silence, it's precious. Write it down so you can refer to it later. And you'll be marvel at what said to you, you know, in those days when you read uh, a few days later. Secondly, which is also a very, very good book that you, can do, you cannot do without, is a notebook to write down all the distractions, all the things that come to your mind during your devotions. Have you tried that? Sometimes when you pray, all the things that you that comes to your mind. Oh, I must switch off the lights. Oh, I need to ring so and so. Oh, I haven't forgotten this, have I? I need to do this. There's so many things come to your mind when you want to be quiet with God. What do you do? Write it down. So after you have written it down, then you can tell yourself, look, I won't forget. I'll see to that. But for now, I want to come back to God. You see me? You can also tell God, yes, well, sorry, I got distracted. I'll write it down. And God, I'm here. Like what Samuel said to God, your servant is here. Please speak. Now you will find that your 30, time, 30 minutes time with the Lord is really, really precious. It's a moment your spirit will be refreshed and then you'll be nurtured. And slowly you begin that the precious moment of Jesus is worth spending because Jesus said, this is what is necessary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have given us your word to read and to know and come to know you through reading your word. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your Son. Even though when the world rejected you, even though when we ignore your calling, but yet you have not given us up. You came, you woo, 
and you convict us of our sin, and you have brought us to yourself through Christ. Lord, we give you thanks. And we are <coughs> we're sorry that many times we still try to keep you away from our lives because of different reasons. Sometimes because we're lazy, sometimes we feel that we are legitimately engaged with uh, right things or even in the ministry. Lord, we thank you that today that you have reminded us through the incident of Mary and Martha how important it is to sit with you, to listen to what you have to say to us. So Lord, teach us, help us, not only for today, but for this week. Lord, this is our prayer, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.